Good morning. Welcome to this gathering of the family of Jesus. So here we are, uh, in person, still, and online. So if you're joining us online, welcome. Um, we are able to be here uh, because we happened to be in a part of the world which is considered uh, low risk for what's going on in the world right now. Uh, and that may change uh, very quickly uh, over the next couple of days. So please do make sure that you stay in touch with us to uh, know uh, what we're doing about it. Um, and that may involve uh, events or services being canceled or postponed uh, and um, other things that might be, might be going on. So uh, please do stay in touch with us. You can do that. Um, we'll we'll uh, be posting things on Facebook, we'll be sending out emails, um, but of course not everybody is on the internet, so if you're not, uh, we will try and call you. Um, if we're not able to do that, please make sure you stay in touch with us. Uh, it's also very important that uh, you stay in touch with your neighbors too. We are the family um, of Jesus, so uh, everybody is a member of the family. Please make sure you connect with the family the way families stay connected. Um, whether that's uh, texting on the phone, uh, messages on, on uh, the email or Facebook or uh, however you do that, please do stay, ensure that you stay connected. While we're here, uh, just a couple of th notes about this. Um, uh, of course, Graham has been busy going around making sure that everything has been disinfected that you could possibly touch. I don't even want to think about that, but I know that he's done that and has taken care of that. So uh, we're doing the best we can to make sure that where we are uh, is safe uh, and sanitary and, um, and good for everyone to be here. While you're here, please don't shake hands. Please observe the social distancing thing. Um, unless, of course, you're sitting next to the person that you sat in the car with for the last half hour and live with, in which case, well, it's too late. Uh, it's, it's, uh, important, it's important that you do that um, because it helps us uh, uh, do the best we can to ensure that we're able to care for everybody, uh, ultimately. Um, so please make sure you do that. Uh, I will still greet people at the door as we're leaving, but uh, if I don't shake your hand, that's why. Um, if I don't, I won't shake your hand. I'll give you a virtual high five from over here, if you like, uh, or any of those other things that people are now doing. Um, but uh, please do take care of that. Uh, if you need to cough or sneeze, please do it into the elbow of your sleeve. You know all of this stuff. Wash your hands. Sanitizer is a good secondary thing, but wash your hands. You know all this stuff. Um, we shouldn't need to remind people about all of this stuff, but the thing is, have you tried to stop touching your face? It's hard. I mean, even just keeping your hands below shoulder level, it's, it's hard to do that. Um, and you're scratching your head, things like that. Uh, it's hard to do that. So it's good to keep reminding people. If you get sick and tired of being reminded, I sure as heck hope it's because you're doing it. Right? That's why we keep reminding people. So we are here today, that may change. Um, if it does, um, I assure you that we will have something um, on, online next week or uh, we'll, can, we'll post resources and things that, so that you can, uh, you can connect and, and worship at home. Uh, and uh, we will let you know how, that's, how that goes. We gather on lands watched for thousands of years by people of the First Nations. We acknowledge the history, culture, and spirituality of the signatories to Treaty 6 and remember our responsibility as treaty members. We also honor the heritage and gifts of Métis people. May we live the respect that our words offer. In the name of Jesus, who is alive in each of us, peace to you. Thank you for choosing to be here today. We are many and come from many places. We are many hearts, many minds, many experiences. We come as we are, needing what we need, desiring what we desire, but seeking to share our journey with others. 
For all who are thirsty in spirit, here is a place for water. For all who are hungry in soul, here is a place to be fed. For all who are tested in life, here is a place of comfort. Here is a place and a time to share our journey, to travel together in God's love. All are welcome in the circle of God's love. Let us pray. Holy One, we are shaped in your likeness. You have formed us as part of creation. Your love is at the heart of our being. In Jesus is the way to a life that is true. In the spirit, the inspiration to live it. Gathered here, may we reflect on these gifts as we journey together. Amen. So this would usually be the moment when I invite all the children and anyone who's feeling childlike today to come join me at the front. Hang on. Keep your distance. We're going to do something a little bit different today um, because uh, we're going to tell a story together. Um, I really need everybody's help. The choir's going to help. You guys are going to help. Um, uh, Pat and Linda and Perry are going to help. We're all going to help tell this story together. And in order to do that, um, and this works out really conveniently today, uh, we have a big room, and so I need you all to spread out. Kids, especially, I need you to go to different places in the room, as long as I can still see you. You're herding, aren't you? It's the herd mentality. Stay together. Pack. Pack mentality. It's okay. It's an animal story. That's why I'm saying that. Okay. You got to find a spot and stay there. Because here's what we're going to do. We're gonna, I'm going to tell a story. And in this story, we're gonna, the choir is going to sing a song too. And, and there's animals in the song. So just take a moment. Think about what your favorite animal is and what sound they make. So pick an animal that makes a noise. Okay, I'm not just looking at the kids, by the way, adults. I need your help on this too, all right? I know you're thinking to yourself, I'm not mooing like a cow. Yes, you are. If cow is your favorite animal, and they are delicious, uh, if it, whatever your favorite animal is, imagine what sound they make. Now let's all do that. Right, okay. I can see we're going to need help. Okay. One more time. (laughs) 
So we're slightly less than enthusiastic animals, that's okay. Um, when, we, when we get to the place in the song, here's what, the car's going to sing this great song, and when we get to the place in the song where I need you all to be the animals, because they're going to talk, start talking about the animals, um, I'll, I'll give you the sign, and you'll go. <laughs> Excellent, okay. I think you can guess what the story's about. It's about Noah's Ark, yes. It's about Noah's Ark. It's a story that, here's how we usually tell this story. We tell this story about how um, it's, it's kind of like God looked at creation and kind of went, mm, this is not working out the way I thought. I think I'll start over. But just like Bob Ross with a painting, he doesn't want to get rid of everything. You want to keep some stuff. So God decides, he sees this guy Noah, right? Because not all humans are bad. He sees this guy Noah and his family, and he says to Noah, I need you to collect up all the animals, and we're going to put them on a big boat. And while you do that, I'm just going to wash everything else. All right? And, of course, Noah immediately goes, are you kidding? What are you talking about? Excuse me? What? So God has to give him some instructions on how to build the boat, right? So he builds this great big boat. People are laughing at him because, you know, there's no water anywhere. <laughs> But he builds this big boat. And then these animals start showing up from everywhere. And they get on the boat. And this is how it goes. Shall we? Okay, good job, everybody. Good job. Okay, it's a little bit like, uh, I don't know if anybody was watching Stephen Colbert on Friday, but it was a little bit like suddenly he didn't have an audience and he didn't know what to do. 
Um, but uh, that, was, that was awesome. Good job. Okay, I particularly loved holding the microphone over here where most of the adults are. And I could see your mouths moving but couldn't hear anything. <laughs> you got a great job from the kids. Awesome. Okay. Um, but see, we, we so often tell that story as God did this and then God did that and Noah did, Noah did as he was told. But it took everybody. Noah still had to build the boat. He still had to get the animals on there. And they didn't come just one at a time, right? They had to do it together. And when they got off the boat at the end, they had to do that together too. It took all of us to tell the story. Choir had a great song. You guys had mostly some great animal noises. That's how we tell our, own, our stories, right? We can't just tell it by ourselves. We share with each other. And sometimes that goes really easily and really great. And sometimes the person holding the microphone doesn't really know what's going on. But that's okay. We're telling the story together. And we support each other. And it's how we live together, too. So thanks to the kids today uh, for helping us out with that, especially. If you'd like to go with Chris today, um, she's got something to do with you uh, uh, that's, that's awesome today. And uh, have fun with that. And the rest of you, I'm afraid, will have to listen to me. Creator Spirit, sometimes our lives are like wading in water that isn't clean or clear, but polluted with actions that are selfish, unkind, and thoughtless. May your grace come into our lives like a life-giving spring of crystal clear water, cleansing and refreshing. Amen. Here is good news. From the deepest well, God gives new life. God's love is for all, bringing peace and harmony to all creation. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our hope. Amen. So there's a little bit of a different way of, of telling the story uh, rather than having the scripture reading. I know you're all really happy about that because you probably remember from Sunday school that the Noah story is three chapters of Genesis and very repetitive. Um, so we managed to tell the story mostly the way we tell it, uh, actually relatively quickly with some great singing um, and apparently some barking, mooing, and cawing, which was also great. So thanks for that. It's a story that we're pretty familiar with because we tell it a certain way. Um, as uh, we often do with most of our stories. It's a story about how uh, basically God wanted to do Earth 2.0 and um, Noah was a righteous man 
Uh, so Noah and his family uh, got to be the ones who build the ark, collect up the animals, put them on the ark. They get off the ark when the world is uh, cleansed, let's say, to start again. And at the end of that story, of course, comes the rainbow, the sign of God's covenant. Um, and, and, and that is, in fact, how the, the, the story appears in Genesis. It's all about getting on and getting off the ark. They're on the ark for a period of time, which 40 days, give or take, which in biblical speak could be any length of time that's long. Um, so we're not really sure how long. It doesn't really matter whether you take the story literally um, or as a myth or a metaphor. Um, it, there, that's how we tell the story. It's about starting again, recreating creation, and starting again because things were not what they were supposed to be. Um, but we miss a piece. It's that piece on the ark. It, whether, you, whether you take it literally, and th there was two of every animal, and start to wonder, of course, why the, the lions didn't eat everyone else, including, uh, including Noah and his family. Um, how the, the whole family managed to get along for that length of time. That's sometimes tricky. The, the fact is we don't know, because there's no discussion about what went on on the ark uh, while all this was going on. So, see... A few weeks ago, I thought I had a really... I'm, I'm touching my head. Don't, don't touch your face, remember. A few weeks ago, I had this I, a great idea. Uh, we traditionally, we, we follow the Revised Common Lectionary most Sundays, but during Lent each year, I like to do something a little bit different and have a theme for Lent. And, and this year, I thought a really great theme would be wilderness. And I know you're thinking, well, that seems slightly obvious <laughs> because the story that gives us Lent is a story about Jesus um, going into the wilderness with the Holy Spirit, uh, being tempted, and then going on into ministry, having figured out how he's going to do that. Um, the, and uh, yes, okay, except that's not always how we know wilderness in our lives. We don't always choose to go there intentionally. Sometimes we just we find ourselves there. Sometimes we're put there. Sometimes we go there with grief. Sometimes we go there just to find things. Sometimes we're lost. Sometimes we know we're eventually going to come out the other side. And what happens there, it can be very different. It's not just about that one story of Jesus goes into the wilderness basically to find himself before he goes into ministry. We experience wilderness in different ways. So I thought a great way to explore that would be to look at different biblical characters and different biblical stories where there's an experience of wilderness and not necessarily how we traditionally see that. So a couple of weeks ago, we started with the story of Jesus, of course, um, going into the wilderness and explored that as essentially uh, intentionally going into the wilderness in order to have an uh, uh, experience and a uh, under, better understanding of ourselves and how we're going to then live, right? Because the story appears for Jesus, it happens between baptism and ministry. It's that he went backpacking in Europe for a few months story. Uh, at the end of Lent, my plan was to, of course, talk about the other great wandering in the wilderness story where we learn how to be ourselves, uh, which is the Hebrew people learning how to be a people in the wilderness. But in between, I wanted to explore some different ways that we might see wilderness. So last week, we talked about Adam and Eve, and I kind of turned the story on its head a bit, and instead of being cast out into the wilderness, which is this place we live in, uh, I suggested we might see the story as the real wilderness is the blissful ignorance of the garden from which Adam and Eve boldly step out into the world to be stewards and co-creators of this great creation in which we live. A little bit different way of understanding the story. And this week, I thought we'd look at Noah. 
and the wilderness of being on the ark. So, just to be clear, I thought we'd look at a story where some people and some animals are isolated on a big boat while the world changes around them. And if you haven't seen that in the news in the last few weeks, you've missed something. I know it's not a cruise ship, but it is nonetheless a story of people being isolated while the world transforms around them. What's going on there? What happens there? And I think the number one thing that happens, and we sure don't hear this in the Noah story, I imagine Noah was afraid. I imagine Noah's family was afraid after they got over thinking he was crazy. I bet the animals were afraid too. I think there's a lot of fear in the story that we missed. And there's a lot of fear in this story, fear of unknown, fear of not knowing what was going on. And the, and the only thing, the only thing they had to hold on to <coughs> was God was at work in this somehow. So, you know, one of the number one things, we, we, I think we, we sometimes wonder, we think, you know, Jesus says stuff. Um, he probably says, love your neighbor a lot. He probably says, uh, take care of your neighbor um, uh, and, and be kind to people, be compassionate, love God. He probably says, don't sin, repent, remember? Probably says that a lot. Just to be clear, he never said go to church. But he did want you to be what we're supposed to be as church. But the number one thing Jesus said, don't be afraid. Said that more than anything else. In fact, I think Jesus probably said, don't be afraid, so much, the gospel writers started to leave out stories of Jesus telling people to not be afraid. It's kind of like the food thing, right? See, I think, I think Jesus, they probably left out a lot of stories of Jesus sharing food with people because I think he did that a lot. Because it's common ground, right? Everybody's got to eat. Yeah, everyone seems to be afraid, too, so it's not surprising that would also be common ground. Most common thing said by Jesus, don't be afraid. I have a feeling that Noah heard God say, don't be afraid a lot. I, I know it's not in the story, so just go with it's a little imagination with me here. I imagine many times Noah was wanting to think, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm sure he thought, I'm not going to get this thing built. I don't even know how to get the animals. I don't, I, I, I'm, this is crazy. And God would say, don't be afraid. I imagine when he started telling his family things, they, once they got past the craziness part, he probably had to say to them, don't be afraid. When it started to rain, when the start, water started to rise, when the animals appeared, he probably had to tell them to not be afraid a lot. I also suspect that once, when they, they, once they were actually on the boat, and I, I know this because uh, I have puppies, and if you've ever had animals, you know, you will actually say, don't be afraid to your pet. They don't understand your words, maybe, but they understand your tone and your touch. They understand the connection, and that's the key thing about this. When Jesus says, as much as when God says, as much as we say to each other, don't be afraid. I can't imagine that anyone thinks that's just about flicking a switch and I'll instantly not be afraid. I can't imagine that anyone thinks if I were to say to you today, don't be afraid, that you'll go from here thinking to yourself, Robin said, don't be afraid, so I'm not going to be afraid. I think we say, don't be afraid. And I think this is why Jesus said it so often. There was no expectation that you were going to somehow flick a switch and suddenly not be afraid. I think we say it. I think Jesus said it. I think God wants us to know it. 
Because when we're afraid, we disconnect. When we're afraid, we disconnect from each other. When we're afraid, we disconnect from things around us. We start to focus on reacting instead of understanding. We don't want to engage. We want to defend. When things start happening around us and we're afraid, we want to stay away. We want to create a barrier. We don't want to, find, we don't want to understand. We don't want to find out. We want to fight it. So, first of all, let me say, don't be afraid. But let me also say, the thing about not being afraid is, we're still going to be afraid. Be calm and stay grounded. Has anyone said that to you before? You know, we use that expression, be, stay grounded. So-and-so's grounded. Yeah, it, it means to be literally in touch with the earth. That's the first thing we disconnect from. We are, we are of the earth, and the first thing we do when we're afraid is disconnect from it. What if we didn't? What if we stayed connected? What if we stayed calm and grounded? First of all. Secondly, what if we could remember when we hear don't be afraid to stay connected to each other? I know we're, we're talking about... Um, Social distancing, right? Stay two arms lengths away from me. We're, we're talking about people having to self-isolate and quarantine. And by the way, all those three things are three different things. So if you're here differently, those are three different things. And it starts to sound like even greater degrees of separation, which it is. But we're still connected. If you are having to self-isolate at home, I hope that neighbors are checking on you and maybe going to the grocery store for you so that you don't have to go out. If you're quarantined, medical professionals are likely taking care of you. Don't be afraid. You're still connected. When we're afraid, we react. We don't want to engage. We don't want to understand. But what if instead we took a moment to try and understand why this is going on, why this is happening? We started to be sensible about how we approached it. We wanted to know the facts, the truth about it, not what somebody posted in a meme on Facebook. Instead of disconnecting ourselves, either by staying away from people and not communicating with them in any way, instead of, of disconnecting ourselves by not really wanting to know but just being afraid, what if we didn't disconnect? What if when we heard Jesus say, don't be afraid, or we hear God say, don't be afraid, or your neighbor or family member says, don't be afraid. Instead of reacting to that with, what do you think, I'm just going to flick a switch and not be afraid? What if we instead heard, I'm here for you? What if instead we heard, we heard, I'm still connected. I'm not alone. Maybe, maybe, maybe even we should, we should stop saying uh, the thing that Jesus said most frequently is don't be afraid and instead pointed out that the thing Jesus said most frequently is don't be afraid, followed by, right? We tell these miracle stories where Jesus heals people, but we leave out the part where he probably spent the whole day with them, probably had some conversation with them, probably said to them, the first thing he probably said to them is, what's going on with you? Tell, talk to me. Engage me, connect with me. Be connected to what's going on. There's a wilderness right there. So uh, if you hear this story of, of, you know, well, of course, when they were on the ark, they all, the animals were all in their own cages to keep them apart. And all Noah and his family did was feed the animals and then it was over. We're, we're missing something there. 
we're missing something. They're stuck there, not knowing how long they're going to be stuck there. Not able to see what's going on around them. What are they going to do? Are they going to just do their own thing and isolate themselves from each other? Or are they going to connect? Did the animals not eat each other because they realized if I do that, there will be less of us? It's just a story, right? That we tell for a particular point. But what if, what if, what if it was more than that to us? What if it was a reminder about how we are connected to each other? People and animals, people and the earth, animals and the earth, we're all part of the fabric of creation. What if in, in, instead we might hear it as a story that reminds us that not being afraid doesn't mean we have no fear. It means we don't back away from it and we don't address it by disconnecting and simply reacting. Instead, we engage each other. We care for each other. We don't cut off the grace and compassion. We bring it out more. We care for each other more, not less. There are ways that we can do that. Thankfully, these days, there are ways we can do that without even having to be in the room sometimes. There are ways that we can still do that, still let each other know that you are loved and cared for, that you belong. We're, we're, not, we're not in a wilderness of fear. When people share love and kindness and compassion with each other. Don't disconnect. Find a way to stay connected, not just to each other, but to the world around us. This is how we are one. We talk about it all the time. We say we are one. Really? I can show you lots of examples of how we're not. But yet, we are all connected. Fear is the thing that breaks that down. So don't be afraid. Wash your hands. Stay two arms lengths apart. Still talk to people. Find other ways. We can't, uh, we can't, uh, we can't always be afraid. Wilderness is not a destination, by the way. It's a place on the journey to other things. That's the thing about the story with Noah, right? The wilderness of the ark, being on the ark. They get off it eventually. They step out into a new world, just like Adam and Eve. Just like Jesus steps out of the desert finally and heads off into his ministry, his ministry of loving and caring, his ministry of connecting and engaging with people. That's, that's life-giving. That's love-creating. Because we are love, and we can share love. And we are loved. Don't be afraid.
Yesterday, uh, March 14th, 3.14 is Pi Day. And uh, in the last couple of years, the United Church has adopted Pi Day as a day to, um, to again remind people of the importance of being uh, public, intentional, and explicit, P-I-E, um, about our intention to be inclusive of all people, uh, particularly from the LGBTQ2S community. And so today's community prayer uh, conveniently fits in with our story of Noah and the rainbow. Uh, it was written by Reverend Ruth, Ruth Noble uh, for the first Pi Day, um, which was uh, last year at the United Church General Council office. Uh, Ruth's intention here is to reflect on the meaning of the colors in the rainbow, uh, both in its biblical origins in the Noah story and as a pride symbol, and bring it to our prayers uh, today. Today we affirm the place of the rainbow in our world. As we pray, I invite each of us into the rainbow to publicly declare inclusion of all, to be intentional in our inclusion, and to be explicit in our support of one another as we affirm that all belong under the rainbow. The beautiful thing about the rainbow is that the colors of the rainbow have different meanings to different people. I remember as if it was yesterday, the day of the Montreal Massacre, I was working at the Globe and Mail and we had CBC News World on all the time. All of a sudden we became acutely aware that something horrible had happened. Fourteen women had been killed simply because of their gender. That feeling of horror has never left me. In the pride rainbow flag, red means life. It is our blood that unites us. We are one people, one family. September 30th is Orange Shirt Day, a day recognizing that the self-esteem of all children matters. It is the day that we remember Phyllis Webstad at a residential school in her orange shirt that was taken from her. All children matter. All children should be able to wear whatever color they choose. In the pride flag, orange means healing. For many years, I tried to live a straight life to the point of making myself ill. Then a few years ago, I just couldn't do it anymore. I could no longer live half a life, and I came out. It was the best thing that I ever did. My illness went away, and I am happier and more myself than I've ever been. In the pride flag, yellow means not hiding in the shadows. Blue means serenity the color of imagination, open spaces, sea and sky. Each of us is called to care for creation. Being green means that we get lost in a forest of trees, and yet we can also become part of the forest, a part of creation. Green means nature for all communities. We are all a part of creation. We are all children of God. It is good to be together today and to be able to celebrate who we are as a community. This is a special sacred place because of each of you. In the pride flag, purple is the color of reflection and spirituality. Each time we gather is a time of reflection and celebrating our spirituality. Let us remember to nurture our spirits so we, our hearts will sing. We are the rainbow people of God. We are loved and valued as one big family. Ever-present God, we come together in prayer this day. We come with our hearts filled with joy and with sorrow. Our journey is often filled with moments of thanks and moments of grief. Each day we hear more and more about lives lost, Lives that have inspired many. Lives that had just begun, lives ended too early, and we try to make sense of it. And so we turn to you with sighs too heavy for words. We are blessed to be in a place where we can publicly share who we are without fear of discrimination. There are many in this country and around the world who are not able to do that. We lift up affirming ministries that extend a hand beyond welcome, a hand of understanding and acceptance. 
Gracious God, as we continue on our journey, let us be mindful of those in the shadows, those hiding themselves, who grieve in silence for what cannot be. May our journey be an intentional exploration of ourselves and may it open us up to new possibilities. May your love reach out to the sick and the weak in spirit, the poor, the hungry, and the homeless, the unemployed, the anxious, and the seeking, the grieving and the broken. Gathered here today, we bring to you those cares and concerns and celebrations that most especially need your love and strength, and we name them as a community, asking for healing and strength for Ken Waldern and Alan Lewis. And for ourselves, O oh God, we are one in prayer, but bring our own thanks and our own concerns. If some need to say, help me, or save me, or hold me, or forgive me, let these be spoken now in the confidence of our hearts in a moment of quiet prayer. These and all our prayers we gather together in the prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Pour moi, personnellement, c'est très important cette église parce que c'est avec elle que j'ai connu l'Église unie du Canada. On a été accueillis dans cette église ici euh, dans un moment très difficile dans notre vie parce qu'on est arrivé ici comme réfugié politique à cause de la dictature au Chili l'année 73. On est arrivé ici là, en janvier 74, en plein hiver. Gracias, Señor, por esta cena. Gracias por el amor y por la amistad. Venu avec sa famille, son mari et ses enfants du Chili, Rosa Elena Don Socruz se crée une vie nouvelle à Montréal. Au Chili, elle était catholique et militante. Rosa et son mari Gonzalo sont maintenant protestants. Gonzalo, qui était prêtre catholique, poursuit sa vocation comme pasteur protestant. Ensemble, ils ont fondé plusieurs communautés latino-américaines chrétiennes, dont la dernière se trouve au sein de l'Église unie. À Camino de Maus, la justice et l'égalité sociale sont au cœur de leur mission et de leur spiritualité. Mais Rosa gardait au cœur un rêve qui lui était cher. Bon, officiellement, ça fait quatre ans que je suis pasteur ordonné. Mais je pense que je suis né avec la vocation comme pasteur. Mais il y a beaucoup de personnes qui me sont parlé de faire les études, de, de officialiser l'éducation et devenir pasteur, mais peut-être j'ai eu un peu peur à cause de la langue, à cause de... Je ne sais pas, j'ai senti quelque chose. Mais finalement, j'ai pris une grande décision, j'ai fait tous mes discernements et j'ai fait tous mes études en français. Pour moi, c'était un grand défi. J'ai fait un cours en espagnol par correspondance avec un séminaire à Cuba par Internet. Mais après ça, j'ai fait tout en français. Et j'ai réussi. Et je suis très contente parce que je me sens remplie avec ma vocation pour pouvoir servir à ma communauté, spécialement latino-américaine, à travers l'Église unie, qui est une, pour moi une église très ouverte. Très inclusive. Bueno, adelante entonces, esperamos que lo recibamos con un gran aplauso. Depuis les tout débuts de Camino de Emmaus, la paroisse Saint-Jean de l'Église unie à Montréal a accueilli et encouragé le développement d'une communauté de langue espagnole. On estime qu'il y a à peu près 90 000 personnes de langue espagnole dans la ville. Ici à Saint-Jean, 600 qui ont fait le culte en espagnol à ces paroisses. Après le culte français, qui se les ont fait les francophones à l'Isère et demi, nous, c'est à midi et demi. Et c'est ça. Les latino, c'est en espagnol, c'est pour les latino-américains. Mais on n'a pas fermé non plus. Des fois, il y a des Québécois qui viennent aussi pour pratiquer son espagnol. Alors, on est très content de les accueillir aussi. Parce que c'est une paroisse qu'on veut que soit intégré, plus que s'enfermer en ghetto. Alors c'est pour ça que nous essayons d'être le plus ouvert possible, surtout à la société d'accueil ici pour les Québécois. On partage l'église. Et on partage vraiment, parce que c'est comme chez nous. La communauté de Saint-Jean nous accueille, nous sommes comme ensemble. Je pense que nous sépare la langue, les cultes qu'on fait en différentes langues. Mais on a beaucoup de choses aussi qu'on fait ensemble, on se rencontre. Je pense que c'est une expérience très riche pour l'Église unie, si vous pouvez écouter. Et si c'est témoin peut servir, parce qu'on sait que... Il y a des paroisses eh, encore que c'est difficile de pouvoir partager avec des autres paroisses, même anglophones. C'est pire si c'est un francophone des fois. C'est pire. Alors si ce témoin peut servir pour faire un appel à les églises anglophones, 
si peut ouvrir le temple à les autres parois qui sont besoin. Pour nous, c'était une expérience très, très enrichissante. Les paroissiens du culte en espagnol de Camino de Emmaus viennent d'un peu partout de la région montréalaise. Il y a aussi des francophones qui se joignent à eux. Et la majorité d'entre eux sont des gens qui ont vécu une expérience d'immigration, un temps d'adaptation parfois difficile. Rosa Cruz les accompagne. Bon, la première chose, c'est de servir. Pour moi, c'est très important être à l'écoute des de personnes qui ont besoin et pouvoir euh, donner et être à l'écoute des besoins et chercher des solutions pour les personnes. Et la plus importante après ça, c'est la principale, c'est de pouvoir évangéliser, pouvoir dire à les personnes que connaît l'évangile, connaît Jésus, qu'on a un espoir dans la vie. Please remember the work of the church uh, around the world, in our own country, in our own community. Uh, if you've brought an offering today or would like to make a donation, please use the boxes that are in the entryway. And thank you for supporting the work of our church. Uh, there are uh, many important announcements uh, in the bulletin today. Uh, please take note of those. Uh, the most important thing of course, is to remember that things may change in a moment's notice and you should stay connected with us. Um, and uh, please try to do that. Uh, if you're not already uh, a friend of the church on Facebook, please do that if you're on Facebook. Uh, if you don't know whether or not we have your email address, please call the office and make sure that we do. Um, otherwise, please just do call whenever you feel you need to. Uh, and if there's anything or any way that we can help you, um, over the next few weeks, please do make sure you let us know. Uh, we will uh, try and stay in touch as best we can uh, and make sure that you know what things are happening, if anything is postponed or cancelled, and how that's all going to work out. Uh, are there any other announcements today? I have one, Rob. I won't come too close to you, but I have an important announcement that uh, I've just discovered that there's been a cure found for this coronavirus. Oh dear. And if you cut it in half, it'll be enough for you and Lori. Oh great, a piece of toilet paper. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> That's uh Wait, I don't know where that's been. I don't think it's been used though. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wilson, for that wisdom about um, the, the virus. It is not cured by toilet paper, so it's not gonna help you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and for that reminder, be sensible and be wise about it, and we'll be fine, um, please. Seriously, I'm not touching that, you take it with you. That's not gonna, I mean, okay. In this moment and in the days to come, may the Spirit inspire your life. In each breath, may there be peace. In each step, may there be grace. In each word, may there be compassion. In each encounter, may God's love be known. May we go boldly and without fear, for we are loved by God. Jesus walks with us and the Spirit leads us. May God bless each of our journeys. God is with us. We are not alone. Amen.